Our first talk today is from the very well-known observer and member of the BAA, uh, Dennis Pazinski. He uh, came from Lancaster in Lancashire, uh, but he's now retired, and he's retired to the north coast of Scotland, to Port Mahomac, uh, which is near the most northerly point of Scotland. Uh, he's secretary of the Comet section. It's not, it's not, it's not the north. It's only about 100 miles south. <laughs> well, it's, 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 anyway, it's, um, it's up there some. it's up there somewhere. Yeah. Um, so he's secretary of the comet section of the BAA, and he's associate ed editor of the Astronomer magazine. He's been on the council of the BAA, and uh, he's been a past director of the deep sky section. He's been given an honorary degree by Lancaster University for his contributions to astronomy. He's been given the Stevenson Award of the BAA. And he's got an asteroid named after him. He's been given various other prizes, with too numerous to go into. So his, his observatory is at, is at this uh, this place in the <laughs> north of Scotland, um, which is a, a nice dark place, except in the summer, of course, when it's light all the time. But it's 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 good for seeing the aurora, and uh, he specialises in transient objects, novae, supernovae, comets, asteroids, and is often the, one of the first to report them, uh, a really assiduous observer. Uh, today, he's, uh, he's talking about discovering comets, uh, what uh, amateurs can do, uh, how, how amateurs can work, can they still discover new solar system objects in this age of uh, giant telescopes and uh, electronic surveys, and uh, he, he's going to tell us how uh, amateur dedication and just time put into it uh, can still win rewards in, 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 this, in, this, in our time. So uh, give a warm welcome, please, to Dennis Pazinski. Perhaps somebody can uh, sort this for me while I just make my opening remarks. Well, first of all, very pleased to uh, to be here amongst uh, friends, some old friends, some very old friends. <laughs> we have known for a long, long time, and hopefully after today, some new friends as well. That would be fantastic. But when I've been coming to Scottish astronomy weekends for many years, and there's been gaps, obviously, but uh, I've been coming for many years. There've been some fantastic. Scottish members. Now, I'm just going to name one or two now. Dave Gavine, Rod Livesey, Neil Bone. These, these are fantastic astronomers, amateur astronomers who have now passed away, but we don't forget them. Never forget them. When I am very often very impressed with speakers who come from distant places, sometimes foreign lands, to meetings like this, and then speak to an audience like you in the native tongue. I have to think that is fantastic, but I can give you some reassurance today that I will not be speaking in Scottish Gaelic. <laughs> <laughs> I shall be delivering this speech or talk in my broad Lancashire twang. So if anybody doesn't understand it, ask me later. What I would like to talk to you about today is comet observing. I've been observing comets since 1975, when Patrick Moore came on the TV and said there's going to be a fantastic comet, the brightest comet that may ever be seen, Comet Kutek. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never saw it, and thousands, probably millions of others never saw it too. It was quite a nice comet, actually, when we looked back at the record, but it wasn't one for the casual observer, let's say. And when I started comet observing, it was pretty simple and straightforward, and that is a complete contrast to what it is today. What we're able to do then, to what we're able to do today, is a world worlds apart it's, it's so different and i'd like to 
tell you today about what is possible and what some amateurs around the world are doing today. So it's non-professional. This is for us, not the professionals. This is what we around the world and people like us are doing in astronomy. So, to write my name across the sky, that's what you can do with a comet if you discover it. In fact, it's the only celestial object that you could discover and have named after you. No other object in the sky that you discover, star, supernovae, galactic bursts, gamma ray bursts, anything has got a designation. But comets are the only object in, you can discover that will have been named after yourself. So you can literally write your name across the sky. But is that enough of a motivation for people who want to make a contribution to the science of astronomy? And particularly cometary astronomy. Well, this is a beautiful picture, isn't it? It must have been nice to stand there uh, on that hillside and watch that comet passing by in 2020. We'll come back to that comet later on. Professional research is done, obviously, with instruments, huge telescopes, pan stars and linear and all these major observatories that have got search telescopes that are looking for near-Earth objects, things that are going to impact us like the object John was talking about last night. And they're looking for these uh, impactors to save us if they could. But these telescopes turn up comets as a byproduct. And these comets are named after pan stars and linear and other boring acronyms like that. They're not named after people like George Alcock or Don Mackholtz. Again, I'll come to these people later on. They're, they're, they're byproducts, really, which is a bit of a disappointment, really, because comets are more important than that. In fact, they could be, other than the sun, one of the most important type of objects in the solar system. Of course, we look at comets as well with spacecraft. Uh, we, we, we observe comets as they come in and destroy themselves as they come into the sun. The Kreutz uh, group of sun grazers, as they come in uh, very close to the sun and become destroyed. So we look at them with spacecraft. We've also visited comets in the recent past. And there we all, all remember the fantastic uh, uh, probe there that went to Churyumov Mokrasimenko. So that's what professionals do in astronomy. They use big telescopes and they spend lots of money. That's not to say you can't spend lots of money as an amateur astronomer. You certainly can. But anyway, let's go back to a little way. This is to traditional amateurs have used visual methods for discovery and monitoring. And these two guys are stalwarts of the BAA. Denin, William Denin here, William Frederick Denin, discovered five comets with that telescope, with that telescope from Bristol. He was the first director of the BAA's meet, uh, the comet section. And uh, he was a fantastic guy. He was a meteor observer and quite an eccentric as well. But he was, he was very much uh, a visual observer and he discovered five comets and, and did lots of work in meteor field. The B, when he set, began the BAA's comet section, his, his main priority was getting people to discover comets. That's all he wanted them to do was discover them. He wasn't interested in how they looked or how they, whether they disintegrated or anything like that. He just wanted people to discover them. But he couldn't actually find enough people to do it. And in one report of the BA's comet section, he said, I think we're going to have to fold this section. Nobody wants to do this type of work. But fortunately, we were able to carry on and other people came in and we were able to do comet work and we finished up with uh, Windick James, who's now the comet section now, the direct descendant of William Frederick Denning. So Denning yeah, discovered five so comets. <laughs> <laughs> Denning discovered five comets and in the 50s, this chap, George Alcock, discovered five comets as well. And he did them with this instrument, this, this, uh, this binocular telescope and uh, he was a fantastic guy because he also discovered Novi like Denin did and these two were, 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 were the traditional type of comet seekers, comet searchers and they both had their comets named after them and they're still there in the records and some of these comets come back and, and, and we can observe them again. Well, the 21st century comet observer, i.e. where we are today, 
the observing has been revolutionised by the electronic age. We don't use film like we did before, uh, you know, in, in 35 millimetre format or bigger formats. We use, we use electronic cameras, CCDs and CMOS cameras. And this is examples of, of what a typical amateur telescope might look like today. The one on the right has got a, uh, a nice um, equatorial mount there with a, a very nice telescope on it. And this telescope has got a, a spectrograph on it. And I'll come to that in uh, those type of observing in a moment. Well, the categories for comet observing undertaken by amateurs are generally these visual, the magnitude estimates and coma and tail morphology, CCD imaging for astrometry, photometry, monitoring for outbursts, because comets outburst, coma and tail morphology, CCD spectroscopy for detecting and identifying elements and changing emissions, searching and discovery of new comets and recovering periodic comets, and wide field imaging for measuring comets and tail development, and also for pretty pictures. Let's not forget the beautiful aspect of comets. Let's have a look at visual observing to start off. Magnitude estimates can be made with telescopes, binoculars, or the naked eye, depending on how bright the comet is. And this is an example of a light curve which has been produced uh, to show just how bright the comet uh, became and how, it, how quickly it faded over a period of time. And this type of observing can be done with telescopes like the ones we're seeing in this room here, even with binoculars and small telescopes. It's just a question of getting out there and, and looking at bright comets. Now, there are some bright comets around, uh, not often enough, but there are comets around. And if you can observe them and magnitude estimates, then you're doing something which is really worthwhile. Because when you look at the sort of history of visual observation, I won't go through all this writing here, but this is a paper which was appeared in, I think, in, in Nature. And it tells of a light curve of an, a comet being used, visual light curves, to predict uh, the, um, how this comet, Ross and Metcalf, has, has come into the solar system, gone out, and developed its light curve. You can see another very famous comet, Comet hale bopp I'm sure everybody in this room will remember hale bopp from 95. Well, this visual curve was made, this curve was made by visual observations and estimates of the brightness of comets. So that's one aspect of astronomy, cometary astronomy, that is still pretty vital, really, because we need to have these visual light curves to compare how comets are changing each time they come back into the inner solar system. And if there are differences between the uh, way that the comet brightens and fades during different passages, it's obvious that there's something happening on the comet itself. And that helps us say something about the physical characteristics of the comet. So visual observations of comets still very, very much uh, an important factor in observing comets. And you can look at comets through the telescope and see wonderful features. And here are some uh, drawings made by Martin McKenna in Northern Ireland of, of this particular comet. I think it was uh, of uh, Q2 Macaults. And it shows different features in the comet's coma, the comet's tail. And you can see that there are changes from day to day. So there are wonderfully dynamic things, comets. They're always changing. Every time you look at a comet or observe a comet, it's different every time. It really is worthwhile taking a good close look at any bright comet because the changes are quite can be quite rapid. Visual comet searching, is it still possible? Well, I think the answer is most definitely yes. On a reduced level, you're not going to find five comets like George Alcock did in the 1950s in quick succession. He found two in a week. Uh, you're not going to do that these days because the search telescopes, the survey telescopes, are picking up these uh, fainter comets much further out in the solar system to what they were when these the people like Alcock discovered them. So they're already picked up by pan stars and linear. But some do get through the net in the sense that if you look in areas of the sky that the search program don't really cover very often, i.e. the dawn and dusk skies near the sun, because the big telescopes don't like pointing down to near the horizon and the sky's too bright, you may pick up a comet. Now, Don Macholtz, uh, he has discovered 12 comets in his lifetime, 
over a period of about 40 or 50 years. He kept searching and kept searching and kept searching until he found him. It was all visual observations were Macaulay's comets. Uh, Messier discovered, Charles Messier, a famous comet observer, discovered 12 comets. Leslie Peltier discovered 12 comets. Don Macaulay is up there with some of, some of the best uh, comet discoveries in the world. And uh, he, he, he's an American who's worked hard at his hobby, if you want to call it a hobby, and he's been very, very successful. But unfortunately, uh, Don Mackles died earlier this month, which is a real shame because he wasn't that old. He's a little bit younger than me, actually, but uh, it's, uh, it's a shame that he died. And uh, But his record stands. But anyway, this is a picture of him not long after he discovered a, a comet there. And he stood there with Brian Marsden, who was a director of the Minor Planet Centre, who received all the comet observations and designated all the comet uh, names and everything. He was in charge of that for the International Astronomical Union. And you can see him there with Don Mackles, and they were having a laugh there, because I think Brian said, what, you found a comet with those two dustbins? <laughs> because that was Don's big binocular telescope he built himself. And he found, a com found comets with a telescope he built himself. That's, uh, that's good. But there are one or two people who are still searching, and this guy in, in Japan, Murakama, discovered comets recently, and he gets out there and he's still trying to find comets visually, and he's very uh, adamant that it still is very possible. So if anybody's got their patience and the aptitude to do it, it's still a viable uh, pastime, let's call it. Well, CCD comet observing, which is basically what most of us are doing now, uh, this is where the great leap forward in comet observing came. And these two very unspectacular pictures show the progress that's been made in comet imaging. And they don't look much at all, but they tell a tale. On the right-hand side here, we've got a picture of the recovery of a, a periodic comet, Brooks, Pons Brooks, in 1953. Well, this was made by the premier comet photographer, professional comet photographer of the era, Elizabeth Ramirez. And she has picked up that comet as a recovery. But you can see it there between those two arrows, just a tiny dot. But the, the thing I want to say about this is when you look at the times and the size of the telescope she used, she was using a, a 36 inch telescope and she had to expose it for 80 minutes to get that picture. 80 minutes. On the right-hand side here, I think we've got a, a, an image from Peter Carson, who sat down there. And he's setting a picture of this comet uh, in 2020, uh, V2. And you can see a little dot there. And he's used a telescope that's about half the size of that one. But he's setting that exposure in a few minutes. So this is a big step forward in comet observing, is that we've got a big increase in the sensitivity of the detectors. And this allows us to do so much more, so much better. So we're now able to measure comet properties with great precision due to digital nature of the, of the images. The most important measures that we can make and the ones for astrometry, i.e. the position of a comet in the sky, which we can use for orbit determination work, and photometry, the brightness of the comet, and see how the comet's developing as it comes in and goes out of the inner solar system. So these are the two things we can do quite easily now with digital imaging. And the comet section of the VA does this very efficiently, very efficiently, and makes a decent contribution to the science uh, of comet uh, observing. Comet astronomy can, can be very efficient. Here's a report of mine which I measured 20 comets in one night. 20 comets I observed in one night and was able to measure each and every one of them and submit a report. Now these look boring figures, just numbers, but when you realise what they are, they're the building blocks of orbit determination. That's prediction of where comets come from and if and when they'll return. And it's an observational of area of astronomy that we can contribute to in a big way. Comet photometry, the brightness of comets, is another key area where comets can make a contribution. And uh, Nick James here, our comet section director, has produced uh, a, a software program which will allow us to make measurements of the brightness of comets in a very systematic and controlled way 
and will allow us to have um, comparisons between observers as to how bright the uh, comets are at a particular time. And this is a very, very big step forward. It's something that we've never had before because people were observing comets visually and making their own estimates, which have all the personal equation problems associated with and subjective problems. But this is a, a method which allows us to um, to uh, measure them, you know, in a standard way. And we can contribute to the photometry of comets in this way. And we submit our, our, all our observations to this international database, uh, COBS, uh, is running a, a Czech observatory, run this uh, database for us. And amateurs across the world can put their observations into this database and they're all collated and, and tabulated and we can use them for analysis purposes. So this is a fantastic resource and it's got people working together, which is a fantastic thing across the world, all for a common purpose. Using CCD images to monitor comets for outbursts is another very, very important area that amateurs can really make a contribution to. And the BAS project on Mission 29, this is Comet 29P schwarzman wackman is a comet which is a centaur, so it's out quite away in the solar system, and it's in a circular sort of orbit, but it keeps having outbursts. You think it would be a nice uh, quiet body, like an asteroid, but it's not. It's a it's a comet that keeps outbursting and closing down and outbursting again. And we've been following this for years and years now. But it's only this last few years that Richard Miles of BA Comet Section has produced a monitoring program using standardised methods of observation, which will allow us to monitor these outbursts in a standard way. And you can see here two pictures I've taken in uh, 2020 showing the comet just after its outburst where it's starting to look a bit fuzzy to this one here where there's a lot of the coma visible. And this comet keeps doing it time after time after time. And finding out the, uh, the cause of these outbursts is a real um, mystery for professional astronomers and certainly for us amateurs. But this type of light curve shows how many outbursts there, there are. And it, this is a period, a quite a short period of time, uh, 20, 2020 to 2021. And you can see how many outbursts there are. It's an incredible number. This is a comet that is very, very active. And we need to know a lot more about it to find out why it's so active. The CCD imaging is ideal for detecting disintegration processes in comets. As some comets come into the solar, in a solar system, they start to break up the tidal effects as they're drawn in towards the sun. And we watched one in 2019, uh, Y4, and I think John showed some pictures of this yesterday, this disintegrating comet. These are all my pictures of, of this comet, showing it looking there like a fairly ordinary, normal comet with a coma and a tail. Well, then it starts to break up, and you can see here, this is all broken up into bits of rubble and eventually disintegrated and disappeared. And so we can make observations like this with CCD uh, instruments now, which we couldn't do before. It was impossible to do this in a visual fashion. Uh, the last time I saw any good observations of a disintegrating comet was by John Bortle of Comet West in 1976, as it disintegrated into many pieces. But that was a bright naked eye comet. This comet you could never see with a, with a naked eye for sure, and it was a difficult object in the telescope. But in CCD imaging, we can see it in detail and actually measure these individual uh, components and see what's happening in the dynamics of the comet disintegration. So that's an area of comet astronomy that we uh, do at the moment. Just this last month, these two guys, two German guys, Raymond and Jaeger, two of the best comet photographers on the planet, amateur photographers, have been observing another schwarzman wackman comet. This one is 73P. And you can see here that they've discovered fragments of this comet. This was a disintegrating comet. It's been around a few times. It's been disintegrating for quite a few returns. And they've picked up new fragments. There's one right up there at the top. I don't know if you can see it. It's labeled one quite close to the nucleus there. And I think there's another one somewhere else on there. But there it is. You see it in the middle there. 
and they've discovered these new fragments that have actually appeared in these last few months and they've been credited with the discovery of these fragments by the uh, Minor Planets uh, Centre. And these are two amateurs who, who were prepared to observe the same comet over and over and over again and find new, new uh, features with uh, this disintegrating comet. A fantastic guy. A wide field imaging of comets allows us to distinguish and follow changes of tail structures and disconnection events in the, mainly in the, in the tails, obviously, where you've got solar wind effects interacting with the comet's tail and distorting it, and you've got uh, disconnection events when you've got uh, uh, large amounts of radiation passing across the comet's tail, showing these distortions. This is all one comet and how it looks on different days. So they are fantastically dynamic uh, objects and they change from day to day. And we can see these changes quite readily with, with imaging that we have today. Now, spectroscopy is another area of astronomy for comets that amateurs are beginning to make some progress in. I'm not saying that we're groundbreaking, but we are actually able to start and see some of the main emissions from in comets' uh, new uh, coma. And you can see here a couple of, uh, of spectra which were taken. One of that disintegrating comet, both of that disintegrating comet 19Y4, uh, one by David Boyd, the BAA, and this is a, a, a spectrum of his. And this is a, a spectrum taken by a fellow called Chris uh, Eric Bressink in Belgium, who's also a BA comet section member. So these people are taking some spectroscopy of comets as, as the, uh, the brighter comets, the more active comets. And this is another area that's being developed at the moment. Although you can do this with very simple equipment. And here's an example of a, a very simple type of spectroscopic observation where you've just got a simple uh, uh, lens, really, a telephoto lens with a SAR analyzer filter on the front, which is basically a little diffraction rating, which will allow very low resolution spectra to be recorded. And here, here we've got Chris Wyatt from Australia, uh, who's Taking this um, this uh, spectra of comet uh, 2020 F3 Neo wise when it was at its brightest, showing the main emission bands from that comet. So that's the sort of thing that can be done. Now remote observing, where you've got cloudy skies at home, but fantastically clear skies around the world. These types of uh, situations are now exploited by commercial companies who set up telescope farms where you can rent time on the telescope. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. And this particular uh, uh, company, Eye Telescope, is probably the most uh, famous one. And you can see what sort of setup they've got. So you can book time on any one of those telescopes as long as you've got the money to pay for it. And then you just get your results sent back to your, your, uh, via your internet connection. So you can uh, enjoy comet astronomy from the best sites in the world when you're sat at home or even laid in bed. Now, Lewis Swift said you'll never discover comets laid in your bed. Well, you could do now. Quite possible to do that. Now. Well, the more adventurous and dedicated amateurs have installed their own robotic telescopes in overseas locations. And some BA members have done that. We've got one here, Peter Carson, who sat there um, glowing with his success. <laughs> Because he's got a telescope now set up in Spain at this remote observing facility, and the number of images and the quality of the images and the consistency of the images that are coming back in to our archive from Peter's observatory, which has been running for a couple of years now, is quite remarkable, quite remarkable. And uh, although he's put a lot of money into it, he's got a fantastic uh, setup there. And well done, Peter. But uh, it's also a bit of a holiday place where you can go and stay there while you while you go and, you know, do your maintenance on your telescope if you can persuade your wife it's a good idea. To, yeah. So, anyway, comet discovery using spacecraft imaging. There's still plenty of this going on because the SOHO telescope is still looking at, uh, the spacecraft is still looking at the sun for now. I'm not sure how long SOHO's got left, Nick. Well, they'll keep it going. Keep, I mean, it's, it's very, very old. Yeah. Well, I mean, thousands and thousands of comets have been discovered by SOHO, quite um, sun grazers coming into the sun and being destroyed. And there's been some fantastic views, really, looking at the real lifetime images coming in 
And we all remember Comet Ice on, which was going to be a fantastic comet, but they disintegrated. We saw it coming around the sun there and they saw all spacecraft images and become just a cloud of dust. Seeing that destruction in real time was fantastic. Another comet, see a Comet Lovejoy, uh, was another one which was fantastic, where the comet came in around the sun, lost its tail, came out of the other side and produced another tail, completely different. And you can see this happening in basically real time. Incredible. But we're able to do this now. Denim would have been, you know, you can imagine how we would have felt if we thought that this was coming. Comet discovery using another instrument on the uh, solar telescope is the SWAN instrument. I'm not too familiar with how it works. It's, but an Australian guy, Matiazzo, he's discovered three comets using the SWAN instrument. And this was how one of them turned out to be in the sky. It's uh, pretty fantastic. Michael Matiazzo is discovered with the SWAN instrument. Lives at Swan Hill in Australia. Discovering comets using digital imaging. Well, the Japanese do this quite successfully. And this guy, Iwamoto, is one of the uh, more uh, prolific discoverers. And you can see him there with his, uh, his, um, his camera on the telescope on a balcony. So he's observing from a balcony and taking digital images and then searching them for comets. And this is one that he discovered with, uh, with, uh, in January in uh, what year was that? Nine, that was 2020. So these are discovered recently. Still the opportunity for anybody to do this if you're prepared to get out and observe in the morning and dust uh, skies. Another amateur in Australia, Terry Lovejoy, he is showing him here. He's discovered six comets using digital imaging since 2007. And you can see him there, his, his instrumentation has changed over the years as he's upgraded his equipment and his searching technique. But he's discovered uh, six comets in the course of 15 years. And uh, these are some of the comets I'm going to show you now. I've got his name on them. And I'm telling you, you wouldn't mind having your name attached into these. Look at these. Look at them. They're absolutely wonderful. And this one's a special one. Because this is a sun grazer. And Terry is the only person to have discovered a Kreutz sun grazer, both visually and with his digital imaging. And I think he's also discovered some with spacecraft imaging as well. So these are some of Terry's uh, um, comments, beautiful objects. We're waiting for the next one because you know it's going to be a good one. Confirming comets that are placed on the possible comet confirmation page. Now, in the old days, if you thought you'd discovered a comet, you would tell the comet section director or you, you might send a telegram to somebody. Not now. If you just think you've discovered a comet, you post it on a web page and everybody in the world has got chance to confirm it. And if you a comet is a real object, people like this guy, Graziano Ventre, go out with this telescope, and it's the same size telescope that a lot of us use, and he specializes in confirming comets that are put on the PCCP, and he submits observations to the BA comet section as well. And you can see a, a, a picture there, and a tiny dot, just from that bright uh, streak of a star, showing a comet that he uh, confirmed in 2022-08-24, just a few weeks ago. So he specialises in doing that from his observatory in Italy. So there's another big contribution to cometary science that these guys are making. But the granddad, the daddy of them all is this guy. In 2019, this amateur from a Ukrainian, and there's been some good stuff about Ukraine in that time, Gennady Borisov, an optical designer by profession, he built and operated his own telescope and discovered nine comets with telescopes he's made himself. And that includes making the optics, not just buying some from Skywatch and looking through it. He's built the optics and designed new optics. And when I show you the telescope that he's designed and, and, and made for his new latest discovery, you'll be astounded. This is Bernardo Borisov uh, with a couple of his earlier telescopes that he built himself. He decided to build a new large telescope to find more new comets. The mirror diameter is 65 centimetres, 24 inch, two foot mirror. Its field of view is 128 by 128 minutes across, so big field. 60 second exposure, magnitude 20 on the CCD. 
Well, this camera is a very fast camera. It works f1.9, and it's designed, it's, its optical design is based on a very old optical principle, and it's sort of coined the Hamiltonian design. Now, if you want to go back into your optical uh, textbooks and find Hamiltonian design, you may struggle to find it, because I think it was, it was invented, or at least reported to be a, a type of optics that was related to your own eye. And it was actually um, given before Isaac Newton invented the re reflecting telescope, at least that's my understanding. So he built this telescope to search for comets. And you can see on that animation there, a tiny comet which has been found by him. And what he found was remarkable. It wasn't just an ordinary comet he found this time with this telescope. It was an interstellar comet, a comet that had come from, from outside our solar system, an object that came in to go past the sun and go out again, never to be seen again by us. This was an incredible discovery. I managed to image it, and you see three pictures there showing it moving amongst the stars there, and it's even got a tiny, tiny little tail. So this was taken over a span of about an hour, so it was moving fairly quickly at the time. It was a unique and significant find. Only the second interstellar comet has ever been discovered. The uh, pre previous one was quite a, a professional discovery, but it was quite an inactive object. It didn't really show any activity, more like an asteroid passing through. But this showed cometary features. And in my opinion, humble opinion, it was the most important comet discovery by an amateur ever. Here's a comparison of the size of the comet and the Earth, and you can see just how big the object was in real terms compared to the Earth. This is a Hubble Space Telescope comet, an image of the same comet. And this shows a path of the comet as it passed through the solar system, and just, uh, just how wide open that curve is. Now, just to sort of wind up now, look at the beauty of comets and some wide field imaging of comets and look at look at that. That is a spectacular image of a comet. I think that this is a sort of mini Donatis comet. And Donatis comet was found in the last century in the 18th century, 19th century rather. And it was reckoned to be one of the most beautiful comets. It had this curved tail and this straight tail as well. But this comet was a mini version of it in 2023, I think. And there's a famous picture of, of, of Donatis comet over uh, the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, I think it is. And this one was taken in France and over that uh, church spire. And to me, it looks a, just like a mini Donatis comet. Uh, and it was Comet 2020F3, this comet is. And here's some great examples of comet photography that show the beauty of the comet. And if you get in the right location, you can produce these wonderful sort of composite pictures or if you're using a, 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 a telescope and uh, a camera, a decent camera, you can produce images which show features like this in the tail. And here's a, a monochrome picture by Marco Jaeger showing the fantastic detail in these in this particular comet. And you can see the horizon, the clouds here. So you can see just how big and bright this comet comet was in 2020. I'm assuming most a lot of you saw it. It wasn't so well seen from Scotland because it happened in the middle of, of twilight months for us, unfortunately. Come out over mountain skies. Now, these are spectacular pictures, aren't they? They're just wonderful. The taking pictures for aesthetic value sometimes may show something which is quite rare. And you can see that in this particular image, you can see synchronic bands. That's these straight lines which come out of the coma and the nucleus. And you can see there that red tail at the top, which is uh, reckoned to be, at that time, um, produced by sodium. And some images of last year's comets to wind up with, Comet Leonard in 2021. Here's a, a wide field picture showing the gas tail being distorted by the, the solar wind. And this was, this was taken with a 135 telephoto lens, just a small lens, a fantastic image. There's one by Gerald Raymond that made a astronomy picture of the day. And you can see those fantastic detail in the head, the coma and the tail there being distorted by the solar wind. Another one by Michael Yeager, who's taken from the remote telescope in Namibia, 
show you this detail that was visible on these images with this, of this particular comet. Now this comet was okay, it was about fourth or fifth magnitude, it wasn't really a bright naked eye comet, but the detail that could be imaged now was quite fantastic. And then one of Darian Peaches, who was one of our, our own observers, showing some similar details. So, to wind up, the opportunity to make a contribution to cometary science is possible every time an observation is made. Every record of the comet's appearance is unique. It's never going to be in the same place at this, again. Never ever going to be in that same place in the solar system where we and them are in the same place. It's a unique observation every time. I hope, hope that I've encouraged you to go out and observe comets in all their wonder, all their glory. But at the end of the day, you can contribute to science of comet astronomy and you can do it through the BA comment section. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Okay. I, th I think that was quite an inspiring talk. I hope you'll agree. I, I well remember Comet Neowise in 2020. Yeah because it occurred in the middle of lockdown yeah. where we were all quite isolated and it was quite difficult to find uh, from my observatory it was so low down it was below the wall of the observatory mm -hmm. that I found by going right to one corner of my garden and standing on a step ladder I was able to see it mm. and it was really spooky yeah. because it was so low in the sky it was like it was a, a, an ob a terrestrial object but somehow not of this world. Mm. And I, I could see why comets in the ancient world were regarded as such, such fearful things. Yeah. It was just such a strange yeah. apparition. Uh, and it was only visible for a few days. It was, and it, and I, then I did get some telescope images because in the, when it got high enough in, the, in twilight, mm. I could get it and it was really bright in, yeah. in, in a big telescope. Uh, and one that you didn't mention was Comet Holmes, which was Another huge, outburst, you know, comet. another huge comet, and that was visible for such a long yeah. time. Comet Holmes was a strange comet because it was first discovered by Edwin Holmes, who was a BA member in, I think, 1898 or oh. something like that. And he discovered it when he was looking at the Andromeda galaxy, and he could see a faint bulb next to it. And he thought, well, well, this is a comet. And it eventually did turn out to be a comet. But the strange thing about it was, was that it expanded and expanded and expanded until it was bigger than the apparent size of the moon in the sky. Not as bright as the moon, but the apparent size. And you could see it with the naked eye. And then a few years later, I don't know how many years later, eight to 90 years later, Comet Holmes reappeared near the Andromeda galaxy in the sky, almost at the same point in its orbit, and did exactly the same. Exploded and became this huge gas cloud. And you could see it quite visibly with the naked eye. There's a famous picture in the VA Journal of yours studying from outside Burlington House pointing up at this comet in the, in the sky. On the header of the website. Yeah. Actually. It's the one which looks really weird with people standing in the middle of the Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This was visible quite yeah, easily than most people have seen it. But that was an extraordinary comet. But it is an example of what comets can do and how surprising they can be. And as you say, when you go back to ancient times, and these things just appeared, moved across the sky, not like anything else, because the planets were all in a sort of band in the sky, and the stars looked all the same all the time. These comets appeared, and they moved in strange ways, and looked different, and developed, and disappeared. And people didn't know what they were. Yeah, they're all, and they're all different. Absolutely. Every Hope, one of them. had no tail. It was just like this yeah. UFO-like yeah, object, right. this yeah. big sphere. Anyway, let's uh, have some questions from the audience. Yes, at the back here. How did I get involved? Oof. Well, as I said at the beginning, I think, is that Patrick Moore came on the TV in 1975 and said there's going to be a brilliant comet in the evening sky. So I went to look for this on this, on this predicted place at the predicted time around the uh, Christmas or New Year of 75, uh, 74, 74, 74, 73, 74. Oh, 73, 74. And so I, I went to look for it, but didn't see it. But I did borrow a small telescope of a friend who I worked with, just a hand telescope, 
and the moon was there, so I looked at that, and I thought I could look at Saturn and maybe just see the, what I thought might be the rings. And then eventually I bought myself a, I went to the local newspaper and looked in the one ads, found a telescope that an old guy had built himself and bought that. And I went and looked at my first comet, which was Comet Pion, Comet Deres, which I uh, looked up from the Sky and Telescope. John Morton's Comet Digest said that this periodic comet was going to be returning and gave a path across the sky. And I eventually tracked it down with the small telescope that I bought off this old guy. And I've been observing comets ever since. Hundreds of comets, dozens of times, dozens of times. I mean, I observed 29p on 93 occasions at the last apparition. Uh, so, and that's just one comet. I might observe 20 comets in a night. So there's plenty out there to do. Many that I don't observe, many that Peter does and Nick does. It's, you know, comet observing is endless, endless. So that's how I got into it through the BA, Patrick Moore, like many of you. Anybody else? Yes. No, um, my telescopes are semi-automated in the sense that they a go-to telescope, but I operate them from a computer uh, next to the observatory. But I've not only got one telescope, I've actually got about 10 telescopes in my garden. And during the night, I'll observe with one particular comet one way, another telescope will look at another set of comets in another way, maybe astrometry or ophthalmometry for another. I might do some wide field imaging with another telescope. The aurora might be going off on the northern horizon, which is okay if it's uh, if there's not a comet in the northern sky, and then it becomes light pollution. You know, <laughs> the small images. But, you know, all this is going on. The meteor cameras are going at the same time, so my nights are full, completely and utterly full. I've got yeah, ten telescopes in my garden, and the telescope nuts as well. <laughs> I've owned them. Yeah, that's me. Very tolerant. Sorry? Liz is very tolerant. She's absolutely very tolerant. Absolutely, yeah. Can't, can't credit my wife enough with the life she's had with me. <laughs> <laughs> right, any more? Well, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, yeah, great to be amongst you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.